Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Housing 21 Trading Update. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. If you wish to ask a question, we ask that you please use the raised hand function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you have dialed in, please select star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute. Instructions will also follow at the time of Q&A. I'd like to remind all participants that this call is being recorded. Questions will follow after the presentation. I will now hand over to Bruce Moore, Chief Executive Officer, to start the presentation. Thank you for joining us this update. Um, um, and um, I'm Bruce Moore, Chief Executive. I'm joined here by Andrew Shaw, our Chief Finance Officer. Um, I'm going to take you through to the table of contents. And, and so I'm going to talk about the, um, some of the factors about the House 21 our distinctiveness, our, our market position, our strategic ambitions. Then I'm going to pass it across to Andrew Shaw, who's going to talk about our financial position and treasury management. And then I'll have a final closing slide for a few back to me uh, for that process. So who are Housing 21, our market position? Um, we are um, a leading provider of retirement living and extra care properties. We're celebrating our 60th year this year. We were formed in 1964. We work right across England, from Cumbria to Kent, from Northumberland to Cornwall and um, you know, right across many local authorities. We've got just short of 24,000 properties in total and we're the largest provider of extra care with over 10% of the market. And we also deliver nearly 49,000 hours of care into uh, social care into our extra care properties. Um, where we fit into the market, so we're not a general needs housing provider, um, but we are a specialist in providing housing for older people that's either retirement living or housing, you know, independent housing, but with domiciliary care, which is extra care. But we don't provide institutional care, so residential care is not part of what we do. And so we, you know, we're very much into um, our position. And our extra care and retirement living help older people remain independent in their own homes for as long as possible. In terms of our governance, we've got a very simple governance structure. Um, so we have a, a main entity. We don't have any separate developments or funding vehicles. We do have um, three subsidiaries, however. Two are linked to PFI schemes in Kent and um, in, in Oldham. But we also have a, one single scheme, uh, extra care scheme in Guernsey, which requires a separate entity. But we hope that by having a, a clear, simple governance structure that allows us to be more effective and, and simple. Um, we're also um, had our, our rating for the uh, housing, uh, rate rate of social housing. So a V1 and G1, last rated in December 2023. We're due an inspection um, in, in early 2025. So um, we're hopeful and positive that that will produce um, good results. Um, we recently just renewed our strategic framework. So really holding fast to our key purpose, finding high quality housing with care and support for older people and modest means to allow them to live with dignity and autonomy. We don't have a traditional adjective based set of values, but we've got three guiding principles. 21, which is about providing modern, contemporary, forward-looking services. Better, focusing on continuous improvement, innovation, and trying to be the best we possibly can be. And experience, really putting the residents' experience at the heart of our, our services. And that's reflecting their new strategic framework. Resident satisfaction is the centre of that, that strategic framework, surrounded by five in, in factors which we believe will drive resident satisfaction. That's quality services, quality properties, being accountable, affordable and providing devolved decisions to our residents. And that's then supported around that by the factors in our corporate services that support those things. So our people and culture, our systems and data, our governance and leadership and our financial viability. And the outer circle is about trying to do more and trying to do better. So that's about our growth and our innovation, our influence and our sustainability position. So um, we've got, um, in terms of key property information, um, we've got um, about half our properties, um, which over half our properties were built pre-1990. So that means we've got quite some older properties within our portfolio, but we don't have many tall buildings. So in terms of um, over, over um, 18 metres, just 1% um, of our, our properties, a very small proportion of that. Most of our properties are social rented. and We do have some shared ownership, so about um, nearly just sort of 1,600 shared ownership properties. We've disposed for most of our leasehold portfolio but actually we've got some more leasehold properties coming back into our portfolio due to an acquisition, which I'll talk about in a, in a, in a while. 
And the Manch Brothers is our Alden PFI scheme, so they're council, council owned tenancies, but we manage them as part of the PFI in that, in that scheme. Um, so that's all fair. Um, so retirement living. Um, so we've got nearly um, just sort of four, four, 457 schemes, um, just sort of 14,000 properties, um, including those we manage for Alden Council. Retirement living allows people to maintain their independent choice in self-contained apartments. The communal facilities are a communal lounge. We have a, a 24-7 alarm system and an on-site local housing manager who um, is based there during, during the working week mainly. And their residents are, don't require direct care services or if they do, they source that independently. Our average age is just over 75 years and our average tenure in that type of accommodation is 5.9 years, which has come down from where it was before. And that reflects some of the um, acuity and the, the, the stresses that we face within our older population. The retirement living priorities within our services are quality and consistency. That's not necessarily sameness in terms of consistency, but actually trying to make the same standards and the same uh, benefits of services right across our services. We want to grow, there's more demand and more opportunities for retirement living. And the future of retirement living is really thinking about how our services have changed. They've changed over the 60 years of Housing 21, but keep on thinking forward about what older people are going to want in their, in their future lifestyle. Recognising the increasing support and the complexity of the needs of our residents, we provide great services that allow them to let to accommodate people with um, you know, increasing needs and, and services to allow them to remain their independence. And investing in our employees, because they're a key means by which we provide high quality services and that consistency and quality of standards. So retirement living makes a real difference to people's lives. And here's a quote from one of our residents, um, really you know, reflecting that sense of you know, addressing people with vulnerability, providing a reset for them, but also a really positive environment where people can be, live their best lives in, in their, their older age. So extra care is our alternative service. It's 191 schemes, um, just over 10,000 properties. It makes us, as I said before, you know, the largest provider of well, the largest provider of extra care in the country, with nearly 10% of the services. The same principles of extra care are a self-contained accommodation, um, independent living, not a care home, so people have their own autonomy and their own self-contained apartments, more communal facilities, so a communal lounge, but also restaurants and hair salons. And, and the meal provision is a key part of uh, the extra care offer, alongside having a care team based on site. Still, the, the, the alarm system and provisions there, but actually having that autonomy allows that all, you know, couples to stay together and people avoid the need to re enter institu institutional care because that care service and the meal service allows that extra level of, of service there. A age there is still slightly up at 77.1 77 years, but um, the average tenure is also increasing. And that reflects the ability to allow people to remain independent for longer in extra care services. So 3.3 years for that. And the strategic priorities for extra care um, are really about resident satisfaction, uh, make sure we have high quality and high compliance across our services, and really looking at the performance of our, our operations in terms of that, that service area. So resident satisfaction is really key. That's supported by making sure that we've got the right people and leadership within the organisation and the right services, the right systems to support that process. I mean, we've been investing both in our people and systems to support our extra care priorities. We also provide care into our extra care services. So 49,000 hours of care into our care services. The next slide will actually talk a little bit about the proportions there, but this is about you know, care that's commissioned by local authorities, usually under a three-year contract, but sometimes with up to two years of extra extensions. Our care satisfaction is really strong and our care worker turnover is, is just over 15%, which is um, you know, compared with the, the rest of the sector is, is really low, less than half of the employee turnover. So our turnover from our extra care portfolios is 53 million, 2,700 employees um, and care services, 77 care services. We now are providing care into just short of, um, uh, uh, just, just less than 50% of our services. That reflects some of the acquisitions we've made. And we, the map there shows where we, we work across the country. So um, it, we've got a lot of services in the northeast, in, in, in Sunderland and the Newcastle and Gateshead. Uh, we work right across a strategic partnership with North Yorkshire, but also a strategic partnership with Warwickshire. Uh, we've got um, a pilot cluster in, in, in the Wirral, in, in, there, in, in the in North, Northwest. Um, and then we've got more services now in London following our acquisitions from 
uh, Notting Hill Genesis and Clarion. Uh, we've got a Kent PFI, which is across Derry and Kent. And then across the south coast, we've got a, a five services in, in Portsmouth and then services in Dorset, um, Plymouth and Guernsey at the bottom of that, that diagram. In terms of care quality, our care quality overall is secrecy is 95% is rated good or better. We have 5% 5, 5 of our services that still require waiting, uh, requires improvement. Um, that's not a position we're very happy about. And we're hoping that um, you know, when CQC next comes to respect, we're confident that they'll go back to a good position. We also have 80% outstanding. That compares against the sector. Overall, 83% of the, the, the CQC position is um, uh, for the hot, hot adult care sector is um, good or better. And 16% requires improvement. So a clear improvement in terms of our position where we provide fair quality against the, the norms for the sector. Um, and then a quote here again about the difference that extra care can make. Um, so care workers allow people to remain that independence you know, and really provide a high quality service and, and great, great support and a safety net and avoid, as I said previously, avoid having to go into um, institutional care, which is uh, not what anyone really wants. So just to a bit more about our strategic ambitions, about what we're doing, what we've achieved through that process. And the three um, themes for that is to, to doing more quality properties and quality services. Um, so we're developing more in terms of our own properties. And we've got on site with um, 15 schemes, um, you know, 769 new properties. And that's more, four more schemes have been added since September, uh, September this year. And that could be another 225 properties. And we've got quite a strong pipeline with a nearly a thousand properties in our pipeline of potential sites, etc. Um, so we've, we've acquired recently from uh, Midlands Heart, uh, um, and, but also we previously acquired from Notting Hill Genesis and um, Clarion, and we acquired 42 properties, additionally just one scheme um, from, from Rooftop um, this year. Um, in terms of quality services, um, we've got um, high resident satisfaction, 86% overall, that includes our shared ownership, which puts us to one of the, the top levels of the tenant satisfaction measures overall. In terms of doing more, um, in terms of development, um, we, we are, our ambition is to deliver 400 affordable like, social rent properties per annum. Um, yeah, we're proud that we're social housing and our, you know, we don't do um, commercial developments to cross subsidise our position there. So, and we'll only do shared ownership um, where it's you know, not so long as mandated, so when it's right to do so. And so yeah, our, our, our tenure of, of choice is, is social rent and um, we don't have properties to sell. So that also helps us have a, a stronger position for helping those older people in, in, in need. So pictures of our recent developments, some very impressive buildings and progressive services. So on the, the top left there, Tanner's Forty Run Corner Retirement Living Scheme, um, nicely positioned you know, near a canal, a very, very impressive building. Um, at the bottom left there, Pacey Walk in Doncaster, um, a net zero, completely net zero scheme, uh, built with off-site volumetric off-site manufacture. Um, top right, um, sandstone um, support in, in Telford, extra care scheme for high energy efficiency standards in there, and Asker Vale and Doncaster. Again, Doncaster is one of our areas where we're building quite a lot in conjunction with that local authority. So both the, the time of living and extra care uh, with Doncaster do, doing more there. Um, so, um, so in acquisitions, um, at the end of 2022-23, um, um, we acquired 427 properties from Notting Hill Genesis. Um, in the following financial year, we've had another 60 properties from Notting Hill Genesis. That was a, a brand new scheme, which was, was a turnkey um, development. Plus, we acquired 440 properties from, from Clarion. And then this year, as I said, there was one scheme from Rooftop and nearly uh, 1,556, 567, sorry, uh, properties from Midland Heart, so a very big acquisition from Midland Heart. Um, the, the great thing about an acquisition process is it allows us to uh, buy, buy properties that, and from other providers and really invest them, bring them to a really high standard. From a business point of view, it's very security efficient because the security pool, what we require, can really be, you know, be replaced on a one-for-one -one basis. Uh, the revenue generating from, from day one and we, we're investing, and the amount we need to invest in those services to be factored into our um, acquisition price. So effectively, we're looking at the EU existing new social housing value is, is what we're paying after we've put a discount up for the investment we need to make. So um, we've, we're looking forward. There's potentially probably more prospects for acquisition, 
but we won't acquire more unless we've got the capacity, both financially and organisationally, to assimilate them and do what we need to in the, in the right way for, for our acquisitions. Um, quality properties has big, been a big commitment for Houses 21. Um, we started our investment moving to a, a higher decent home standard in 2016, but we've made an ongoing commitment to maintain high levels of investment in our properties, which is really important. So we have some catch up with our newly acquired stock um, to bring them up to a high standard, but otherwise we've been carrying on a process of investing, which meant we haven't had the pressures that some other organisations have had trying to catch up in terms of um, under investment. We've got free Wi-Fi in all our extra care properties and over the next two years, that will be rolled across, across all our retirement living properties as well. And in terms of our enhanced property standards, um, we've got, we have a, you know, decent homes is the, 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 back, the backdrop for everything, but actually we're investing in, in, our, in our, you know, our standards and our frequency of replacing kitchens and bathrooms. So across housing 21 properties, that's 100%. But there's some catch up with the new developments we've acquired from um, from new other providers. Um, in terms of makeovers, we, we commit to make, having a makeover, a design led makeover, refurbish our properties every 10 years. You see that for the acquired stock, they haven't had a, that, that investment and that refresh um, for some time, so hence only 5% of the acquired stock meet that standard. So 19 schemes needing, needing a refresh there. EPC, 99.8% of our existing House 21 stocks there. 95% for our acquired properties. So again, we have a program to get those all up to the EPC standards um, straight away. And investing, we've invested in our digital call system. So not quite there with that, but on a program that we've had to, to get to 2025. And then the you see other providers, they've been slightly slower in that transition, but we will make sure they all get across to that um, digital um, connectivity by end of 2025. In terms of compliance, we have um, a, a huge commitment to make sure that all our properties are uh, completely compliant from a safety and um, assurance perspective. Where we haven't got 100% in those boxes, it's because um, we are very acute in terms of where we're aware of what we have. So a lower lift inspection will not be in use, but we will still record it as a failure when we haven't, aren't using it. Similar with water hygiene, we may be an avoid property, but actually we have an absolute commitment to have 100% compliance across all our um, key areas of, 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 of compliance in terms of the big six requirements there. And in terms of tenant satisfaction, every year we take a, a survey of our residents. We do that on a census basis, so we ask all our residents to complete that rather than just a statistic reliable sample. That allows us to make sure we understand the, the satisfaction of our, our residents in every single one of our sites to make sure we understand what's going on there. Our overall position is, as I said, 86%. And we, our goal is to get to 95%, and so we've been investing and hopefully to improve our services, to listen to our residents. To go. But that's still very high in terms of um, the benchmarks for um, the, um, the comparative with the other organisations. And we do that on a paper or online basis. We don't haven't adopted a different approach to try to um, get to a higher um, satisfaction figure. So that, that's a very genuine position there. And then the last section for me is talking about our environmental social governance position. Um, we've been striving to do the right thing, and previously we had um, what's called doing the right thing reports. But um, in 2023, we adopted a sustainability reporting standard for social housing. That's listening to feedback to say it's helpful to report our compliance and our position against a, a common set of um, uh, measures and, and goals. And so we report against that annually. We've had a, an audit of our compliance position undertaken this year, which was um, gave you know assurance that the reporting we're making is, is sound and, 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 and on, on position. In terms of highlights there, um, so we're in you know, a strong position on the next slide. Um, so I, I, we've got a very strong position in terms of our, um, you know, our, looking at our greenhouse gas emissions overall, um, in terms of um, EPC, very strong position, in terms of making investments and, and taking action to improve energy efficiency, we do some work there. Um, in terms of monitoring our overall energy costs, our overall satisfaction and very, very low level of complaints. And our aim is to have <coughs> no at fault administration, no maladministration findings from the Ombudsman. That doesn't mean we, we discourage complaints going to the Ombudsman, but we should have addressed all those requirements to make sure that there's no adverse findings. So disappointed to have um, some small number in the last year, but actually we're committed to getting to back to a zero um, maladministration case position. 
Um, I have mentioned already the net zero um, uh, uh, scheme with modern methods of construction, modular build um, in, in Doncaster, Pace and Walk, Pace and House. Um, it was the first you know, scheme to meet that you know, zero, zero carbon position. Um, we're also investing in a year's worth of uh, research and, and measuring of how residents are using that new technology so we can understand the impact of that technology and how it impacts on residents and the way they're using those that design and, and make sure we can learn from that process. And I don't say that that's all that's at social rent as well. And then in terms of our environmental strategy, um, we want to make sure that we're um, trying alternative heat sources um, so from solar, ground source, biomass, all the different concept components there. We've got set some, some key targets for ourselves. So we're maintaining EPC right across our stock, but we're also looking to, to, to get to the sea level of the environmental impact rating, which actually measures the amount of fossil fuels going to our properties. We've also set some ambitious targets to reduce the actual total amount per meter square of energy used in our buildings, both 15% by 50% in communal areas and 10% for individual residents. And that's by uh, adopting in efficiency measures and uh, you know, good, good, good governance of that energy mess. And then we've committed, because we hit our EPC uh, target by 2022, we set another 20 years to remove fossil fuel heating from all our properties. So we've got a goal to hit, um, remove all fossil fuel heating systems by 2042. So that's from me and over to you, Andy, for the financials. Thank you, Bruce. Um, so I'll just spend some time taking you through our performance for 2024 and also our performance <coughs> to the, for the first six months of this financial year up to September 2024. So on the left-hand side on the screen at the moment, you'll see some of the key highlights um, um, we achieved last year. So our turnover increased um, to 275 million. Um, we delivered a strong operating surplus, just shy of 28 million, um, and our margin just below 10% there. Um, our margin was impacted by some one-offs, and actually, if you remove those, um, our margin was 11.5. Um, we delivered a strong EBITDA MRI for the year end with, with sufficient headroom and we didn't draw any debt in the last financial year as we were still utilising the proceeds that we had raised from the bond, so our net debt actually decreased. Overall voids were strong against um, previous performance in the sector, so 2.5% overall, and actually day-to-day -day voids has fallen to 1.2%, which is back to where we were and probably below where we were at pre-COVID. Um, in September, um, obviously these numbers are not audited, so are subject to change, but we've started the first six months really strongly. Um, we've delivered turnover of 144 million and an operating surplus of 26.5, with a margin of 16.1, and I'll go on to a bit more detail on the next, next slide. Again, really strong EBITDA MRI compliance of over 200%. Um, and our actual debt has increased, um, net debt has increased, so that's up to 661 million. And we have drawn funds this year to um, uh, acquire the stock for Midland Heart, but also with some loan repayments, so our net debt has changed. Um, overall voids have fallen again, which is fantastic. Um, Relet voids are is similar to last year, but we've seen a decrease in our first debt and strong growth on our, on our net assets. In terms of our, our comprehensive income, you'll see year-on-year -year growth of our turnover. Um, so we were 251 million back in 2023, 20, 275, and we're on course to eclipse that again this year. Um, we were able to increase our rent in 2024 um, by 11.1%, as we were exempt from the 7% rent cap. But actually, what we did um, was we were we facilitated, facilitated a charitable donation to our residents of um, £200 each, and that was equivalent to the 3.7 million. And that's effectively bridging the gap between the 7 and the 11.1%. So that £200 went directly back into the residents' pocket so they could use it to, to um, as they see fit. Um, we did have a bit of catch up depreciation. That was a one off I referred to um, previously, and that was 4.6 million. So actually, if you add that back on, you'll see our operating margin uh, grew year on year. We also had a small charge on impairment, um, largely due to um, contractors, unfortunately, uh, going in, into administration. For the current financial year, again, we, we increased rents um, aligned with the regulatory standards. So they went up by 7.7% at the beginning of the year. And we've also seen strong growth through both our developments and our acquisitions. So that's why we're seeing our, our turnover growing. 
Costs, on the other hand, have probably not increased at the same rate, um, which have improved our margins up to the 16.1. Um, but we do have some time to spend in, in there as well. And we'll probably see a bit of spend coming back in the second half of the year, particularly around our decorations programme. So um, that operating margin might fall slightly. Uh, as Bruce mentioned, we've um, disposed of our leasehold portfolio and, and that largely forms the most of the, the, the other gains on, on disposal of the 3.3 million. Um, and as, as, as I alluded to on the previous slide, our net debt has increased. We've drawn funds from um, uh, our, our revolving credit facility to help fund um, the properties acquired from Midland Art. The pie chart just shows that we are um, sticking to our roots and the majority of our income is on, from rents and service charges. Um, the next the biggest slice of that is, is the care. And then we have a very, very modest property sales. Um, so uh, we're not reliant on that for our compliance. Um, our margins are impacted by the, the services we provide, so our service charges uh, are variable, so we don't make any money on that. That's a, a break even operation. And also our care business, again, is very low margin. So when we compare to our peers, our margins are lower, um, but the, the reason part of, of, of the reasons I just mentioned. Next slide, please. Um, just touching on some of our, um, our lettings performance, so you can see continual improvements on our voids on the left-hand side. Um, so voids did peak a, around COVID up at the sort of 3% overall, but you can see a year-on-year -year improvement on that. And actually all, all the different types of voids that we're presenting here show improvement pretty much year-on-year. -year. Um, Relet, which is our, our day-to-day voids, are, are largely static. And where possible, we, we do try and operate a back to back lets with courts and schemes operating waiting lists and maintain a good relationship with local authorities to manage the nominations. Um, we haven't seen a decrease despite the increase in charges, which just reinforces the, the demand for our, our, our offering. On the, over on the right hand side, you will see our arrears. So, this is the amount that our residents owe us in rent and service charges. Um, unfortunately, we have seen that increase both in quantum and percentage. Um, so in terms of quantum, that's probably expected given the increase in our charge over the recent years, going from 3 million in 2021 up to about 7 million at the current time. Um, I suppose what, what we need to keep an eye on, however, is actually the percentage compared to our rent roll, which we've also seen increase. Um, we continue to walk, um, work with our residents to make sure they're maximising the, the benefits that they can access and um, uh, for support. And our operational colleagues continue to show this in an area of focus to make sure that, we're, we, um, that we can keep this under control. In terms of our value for money, um, in our financial statements, we report on the, the regulatory metrics um, outlined by the regulator of social housing. Um, and again, we, we show year on year um, improvements. The, the one I'd probably pull out that I haven't mentioned today is around our headline cost per unit. Um, it is higher than our peers um, and also higher than the sector. That's largely down to the um, service we offer, so supportive housing generally requires more support, both in time and cost. Um, and as we operate a variable service charge, you can see in that graph that the blue line is, is by far the, the biggest cost. And um, some of that is down to our commitment to maintain the local housing service, so making sure residents can access support on scheme rather than having to um, phone a centralised um, uh, call centre. But also we um, we provide utilities to around 40% of our, our uh, residents' properties, and those will pass through costs, um, which we incur on, on a residence path and pass that through to, to those. Our PFI schemes also impact our costs, as you see on the, the, the chart on the right-hand side, and that's all down to the specification in those contracts um, and what the requirements are but they are funded by unitary charge um, that we receive from the council. So although the costs are higher, our income is higher to compensate for those higher costs. Um, from a balance sheet perspective, we, we show year on year growth. Um, assets have increased largely down to our acquisitions from, from Midland Heart and our, and, our, and our new developments, but our long-term liabilities have also increased as a result, as I say, that we've drawn debt to fund those. We have low gearing, however, and that gives us capacity to continues to grow uh, going forward. If I then just move on to our, our treasury management and take you through a, a few slides on where we are from a treasury perspective. So just setting our, our, our overview, um, we, we have a long dated debt portfolio with a diverse and funding mix. So we have a mixture of banks. Um, our two PFI contracts have their own dedicated funding. 
Um, and then we also have 500 million pounds of bonds that we issued um, back in 2017. And to date, we've sold 450 million of those. Um, we show those at uh, uh, preferential rates, so our, our cost of debt is relatively low, so 3.61% overall. Over the last year, we've been um, busy working with our funders to secure our, our, our funding for the next few years, and we source three new revolving credit facilities, um, totaling 180 million. Our liquidity horizon extends out to 2027, that's around October, and that includes our aspirational growth, so we have sufficient funds available to meet our liabilities as they fall due. And we're very busy at the moment making sure that all our properties are either charged or ready to charge, so when we're ready to, to raise new funding, we've got the securities to back that. In terms of our strategy, um, compliance of our golden rules will not be compromised, and we'll make sure that actually our, our business plan and our budgets and our aspirations will, will not overstretch us, and we're always made, um, mindful of, of what we want to try and achieve. Um, we, we want to diverse our funding sources, so at the moment we are um, focusing on revolving credit facilities, but very much in, in the medium to long term we, we plan to perhaps come back to the debt capital market for bonds. We have a continued commitment to these type of events and one-to-one, -one, so making sure we build relationship with investors. And again, um, our credit rating with standard boards is paramount to us. We want to maintain that A- minus that was reaffirmed back in August. In terms of our cash and liquidity position, um, so over the last few years, if you've logged on to these calls, you'll see um, large cash balances as we, we drew, drew from our bonds and we've been using those funds to, um, to fund our growth. That cash has diminished, however, we still remain um, healthy in, in that area. So overall, the group has over 70 million. Um, however, a lot of that is ring fenced either with our leaseholders or our PFI contracts. So we just have over just uh, just over 25 million available for day-to-day -day funds. However, as I mentioned, we have 50 million pound bond and also 108 million of revolving credit facilities that are fully secured and available to draw at short notice. So, um, so we're in a good position from a liquidity position, and we're just about to finalise a further 50 million, which is expected to be made available in December. I mentioned on, our, on the previous slide that our compliance with our golden rules would not be compromised, so we, we operate within a disciplined financial framework that has regular insight from our board, and again, um, our business plan is always developed with, with these in mind and with these will not be compromised. Um, we have seen our floating rate debt increase over the last six months as we drew, draw from our, our, our revolvers, and we see this as probably a, as a short-term funding strategy with a view of returning to more fixed rate debt in the medium to longer term. We have um, ample headroom with our banking compliance, um, so you'll see they're 295% on an interest cover basis, so our, our banking compliance causes me no concern, and we report that annually to our banks. As I've already mentioned, we delivered on a strong EBITDA MRI um, with sufficient headrooms that we can um, manage any shocks or one-offs in, in, in that and again that shows our commitment to that strong compliance and as I already mentioned we've got liquidity going up to October 27. In terms of our loan book um, it is fairly long dated um, we, with the bond uh, starting to draw back in 2046 on a £50 million pound profile. In the intervening years the, the repayments are relatively modest um, apart from the two spikes and 29 and 30, and those are, uh, are those are the repayments of our revolvers. However, we do have the ability to extend those if we want to, um, and um, we, we may uh, take the, op the option to exercise those. All of the um, the lighter blue green columns are, are our subsidiaries, and again, they're all built into our low PFI projects, so we're able to meet those um, as they support you. And the spike in 2039 relates to, to the Kent PFI project. We have quite a, a vanilla loan book, um, no complex derivatives or anything like that, and we only have three swaps now, and they're all embedded with the PFI entities to, to provide that assurity and that, um, that stable operation of those projects. Um, we, we do get regular updates and valuations of those, and the, the mark to market values has decreased uh, since March, so there's, there's, they're just shy of 8 million at the moment. Um, and as Bruce alluded to earlier, we, we don't operate any tr separate treasury vehicles or anything like that. And, and um, it, which means our, our governance is, is, is able to oversee without any getting lost in the complexity. Um, from, a, from a security position, um, we are very busy at the moment making sure that either new properties are secured or we're releasing headroom from um, those facilities we've already got. And just in, in the diagrams there, it shows some of the potential that we have around our bond and our bank loans that we're working with those 
partners to release that, that headroom um, to add to our security pool. And then we're also going for a big exercise to charge over 5,000 5, units worth just over 300 million to make sure that when we want to raise new finance, all of that is there. So at the moment, we've got roughly 479 million worth of potential security that we can draw new debt. So just to summarise where I believe we are from a, a finance and treasury perspective, um, we are a leading provider of quality homes in a growing market of older people. Um, as Bruce has already alluded to, we've got continued investment in our, in our properties, which are already to a high standard, um, but we want to maintain that. Um, we've got sector-leading property performance, so 99.6%. Um, so, and no real concerns from a fire or cladding perspective. Compliance first is, our, is our, um, where we approach things, and we've got no concerns over damp and mould. From a, from a, um, a um, we've got a prudent low risk profile, so we only deliver low integrated quality care services. Um, we have limited exposure to welfare reform, as a majority of our residents are informed of some benefits of some prescription, and we have um, um, modest gearing, so um, low risk there. And then from an external perspective, <coughs> we're, we're strongly looked at, so standard boards reinformed our uh, grading of A- for stable outlook in August. Um, we have a G1B1, and that's reaffirmed in December from the regulator social housing. And as Bruce alluded to, we're about to go through a, a exercise in the new year to get an updated rating, and we're fairly confident that we'll, we'll, we'll maintain that. And then we're, we're above where the, the rest of the sector is from a, a fair quality position, so strongly endorsed from our external um, partners. Back to you, Bruce, to close. Yeah, so I may repeat some of the things you just said, Andy, but as a specialist for a specialist provider, market leading position in, in retirement living and extra care and a really strong provider in, in our particular space in, in the sector and we have really strong demands for our properties um, that's linked to high quality but also in terms of uh, the backdrop of uh, an aging population uh, and, and a great strong demographic support for the types of services that house 21 uh, provides we have a really solid track record of performance both in terms of service quality and finances um, which to, on which to build and to, to, to operate. Um, you know, the V1, G1 uh, rating from the regulator um, and hopefully to be added with a, a C1 um, when we're inspected um, at the beginning of, of 2025. Um, we're really committed to maintaining our A, A minus stable uh, credit rating with standard of course, uh, really important to us that we remain that investment grade. And, and we're really in a strong position, a, a good um, position around our environmental social government agenda, uh, both from an environmental but also from a social perspective in terms of the, the quality impact that we, we provide. Um, compliance is, is really position, is a really important um, uh, to maintain that as part linked to the quality properties and the really high standards um, and we carry on that investment to uh, maintain and, and enhance that, that position. Um, we have a really proactive approach to risk management and we have plenty of uh, capacity and scope to mitigate any risks that come along, but we have a, I'd say, a proactive approach to that. Um, our acquisitions um, um, and, and, and development, uh, 400 units is, is, a, is a realistic achievement uh, for us, but our acquisitions have been good business for us, but also, as I said in my you know, comments earlier, will be done within the capabilities and capacity of the organisation. And we don't have any market um, sale or market exposure as well, which provides a really um, strong um, assurance in terms of a risk profile. So resident, high resident satisfaction, um, you know, it really backs up that demand and, and reputation provides us in a strong, strong position overall. So um, thank you for um, listening to Andrew and I, um, and uh, back over to the moderator for any, any questions. We will now start the Q&A. If you are dialed into the call and wish to ask a question, please use the raised hand function at the bottom of your screen. We'll take our first question from David Avery of Insight Investment. Please go ahead. Hi guys, morning. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, first question, if you don't mind, going back to the slide on care quality. Uh, there was, I think on the adult social care side, it said that there was 1% of your units were inadequate and another 16% required improvement. There was also 5% improvement required on the uh, Housing 21 overall stock. Can you talk a little bit about that? And then a second question, 
uh, you know, on the back of the kind of increase in employer NI contributions uh, from next year, and I guess the raising of the minimum wage. I mean, you're a pretty staff heavy business. Have you kind of looked at what the impact of that will be in absolute terms, in terms of the impact on the business and also on margins going forward? Thank you. Yeah, so just addressing that, and the slides should be up there. So the this, this was slide was really just drawing the distinction between Housing 21's position and the overall position of all providers of adult social care. So um, in terms of Housing 21 position, we have 5% of our services requires improvement. Um, as I say, I'm confident that when those services are re-inspected, they are ready at, a, at the compliant, at least good stage, um, and so we're confident that CQC have not been back out to, the, to those positions. That contrasts with the whole of the social care sector, which is the 16% requires improvements and 1% inadequate. We have no inadequate services within Housing 21. Um, we also have 8% of our services which are outstanding compared with the average across the adult social care sector of four. So I think that's trying to show the distinction between Housing 21's overall 95% um, good or better position compared with the average across the whole of the other coastal social care sector, 83%. So hopefully that distinction, if I didn't make it got clear. It. Yeah, earlier, got it. Is, no, is thank you. Thanks. So, um, and in terms of the, um, you're right to say there are some headwinds I mentioned in terms of proactive approach to risk management and scope of mitigations. Um, the, the, the national insurance impact will, will be significant, both in terms of um, the, uh, the lower threshold and the extra 1.2% employee contribution. Um, we have done some modelling on, on that in terms of the total overall impact. Um, we are in a strong position around our um, uh, care workforce that we pay um, traditionally 10% um, above the national living wage. We introduced that position um, when there was a big gap between the national living wage and the real living wage. Um, we want to be just over the real living wage as a sort of a, a, a informal benchmark. Um, that margin has decreased now with the increase in the national living wage. So the national living wage is pretty close to the real living wage now. And so there is some scope to look at whether that 10% margin is the right one or maybe may a slightly lower margin uh, as, as a premium for our care workforce. But we, we're confident that, that as well as the additional funding that's gone to local authorities to fund um, adult social care, that we will maintain, as I say, a low margin, but a viable position around our care services. If that's not supported by um, rate increases from local authority partners, we have shown in the past that we will exit contracts and we are able to do that on, on notice. So um, there are some challenges around the national, the national insurance and the real living wage, um, you know, national living wage um, position, but ones which we're confident we'll be able to um, address, um, but we're still maintaining high commitment, high quality and low turnover from our employee base. Yeah, I mean, other things being equal, what, what's the actual impact, the NI impact on um, increased costs in pounds next year? Uh, and so what do you think the, the impact on the margin will be as well? So total overall cost is, is about £3.6 million, pounds, um, but that's partly linked to um, services which will be formed part of service charges, so which will form part of um, you know, care, co care charges which are local authority funded and a small portion of which will be um, a corporate um, um, cost as an employer uh, overall. So we still have some work to do to to manage that out in terms of looking at the scale of things. So do you, th I mean, your margin, your operating margin is what, 9.9% .9 this year versus 10.4% last year. So other things being equal, that's going to take a, a, a further hit going forward or do you expect margins to be flat slightly up from here given other levers you've got to pull? Um, we, we, we're just basically keeping the margins at probably where they are, maybe a bit stronger. Um, that, that's still our goal. We, that's part of wanting to maintain a, a strong credit rating. I'm going to say some of those additional costs will be passed on to our residents through service charge because it's a lot of links to our um, uh, the, the local housing managers, our court managers, um, but also to our care costs, etc. So the amount of the, as a, the corporate cost that we've absorbed from those NI um, um, headwinds is, is relatively small, but as again, we, we are very focused on that and we've still to set budgets for next year. Thank you. There are no further questions on the webinar. I will now hand over to Andrew Shaw, Chief Financial Officer. Well, I'd just like to say thank you for joining us today. Um, I hope you found that useful. Um, we have a commitment to continue to these type of events and, and engagements. 
And if you'd like a one-to-one -one session with Bruce and I in the future, um, we're more happy, uh, welcome to accommodate that. So I'd like to thank you again for your time and we'll speak to you in due course. Thank you.